Well, today we are one week into the year of Bible engagement. Woo! Yeah, excited. We're, we're encouraging you to join hundreds of us as we are engaging God's Word. Our goal is to get the Bible into you and you into the Bible. The Bible into you in 2022. That might be a good way to, to just try to, to remember that. And uh, we're encouraging you to do this as we read Scripture pray a psalm, watch a video. There's not videos every single day, but many days throughout the week. And we're doing this uh, together. And some of you have been doing this for a week, and uh, you're like, wow, I, I need to pick a time and a place to do this because you already missed a couple days and you're now realizing, man, I need to be a little more intentional about my week to make sure I get it in. And I just want to say to you, it's okay. You know, just, just pick up where we are today and continue on. There are others of you in the room right now, or maybe you're listening, and you're like, year of Bible engagement? What's that? And uh, I would just say, welcome to Northside. You know, glad you're here today. It's something we've been talking a lot about uh, over the past month or so. But uh, you can learn about that by going to the Next Steps room in our central lobby, just right out here, or by going to our website, and all the digital content for year of Bible engagement is right there. And we would, we would love to invite you to to get in on that uh, with us, and so would love for that. Uh, others of you, you have completed your first week. Congratulations, just give it up for those who completed their first week. They got it done, so we're excited about that. So you're at Genesis chapter 24, uh, you finished that yesterday, and uh, you walked in today and you're thinking, wow, there are some messed up people and messed up stuff in Genesis. I mean, you're reading it right now and you're just like, man, this is messed up. What's going on? And I totally get it. I totally understand. It, uh, you're like, man, the Bible doesn't sugarcoat this stuff, does it? It doesn't sugarcoat sin. It doesn't skip over that stuff. I mean, it gets, it's pretty raw. It's pretty honest. Uh, you can already see right now, just, just after a week of reading, you, you're like, we need a Savior. <laughs> we need a Savior. And we're not to the New Testament, not close. But you already are seeing the threads that a Savior's coming. Because early on, we just see the power of sin in this world and how desperately we need Jesus. And you're seeing it right now. And, and, and then there's others of you. Others of you may be reading right now. Uh, maybe you're not reading yet. Because the questions that you're wrestling with are a little different. And they go something like this. What makes the Bible different than any other religious text? You're thinking, did the almighty God really choose to communicate to us in written form so we could have this in our hands? Did the almighty God really do that? That this is his specific revelation to us? You're asking questions like, when we read this book, is this reliable? Is it trustworthy? I mean, how can you know that this is the actual words of God? You're wrestling with it. In fact, maybe you're, you're even skeptical of it. Because to the skeptic, the Bible is nothing more than perhaps an impressive literary work of antiquity. And to suggest anything more is wishful thinking, or maybe it comes across as naive. And you're just wondering, what makes this book different than any other religious work? On what basis can we claim that the Bible records the actual words of God himself? And that is a vast topic. And, and today, I want to address that. I'm just going to scratch the surface. I mean, I, I know that. Uh, with the time we have, it's just going to be a scratching of the surface. But hey, even a, a good scratch can be felt, right? So I, I hope you, you feel it today. I hope it's, it's helpful. But I also would say this. If, if you want to dig deeper, here's some of the books that I even looked at this week in doing so. Maybe you want to get Josh McDowell's Updated and Expanded Evidence Demands a Verdict. I'll quote from this book a couple times today. Uh, this will take most people as deep as they want to go. But this is a resource that's at your disposal. You could get this book if you uh, feel like you would like to learn more. Uh, a book like this one, F.F. Bruce, New Testament Documents. Are they reliable? It's been used for many years. Easy to read for the, the average person, uh, but good for scholars as well. And then there's this book, Jeff Vine's Dinner with Skeptics. This is a very easy to read book, and it's good for the average person out there. And uh, several things I'll share today come from this one as well. There are so many resources out there to address this issue, this question. 
can I trust the Bible that I think is great for you to engage and get into? And, and I, I just want to acknowledge that even as we answer this question, can I trust the Bible today? I wanted to address this as we're beginning this year of Bible engagement together. Uh, I know that we're coming at it perhaps from different places, intellectually or emotionally or spiritually. We're not all maybe on the same place as to what we know or what we believe. When I give you some of the reasons why I trust the Bible, not all may resonate with you. And and I'm going to give you an example of that. I'm going to go and give you the very first reason. I trust the Bible. I trust the Bible because Jesus trusted the Scriptures. Now, I acknowledge that when I give you that answer, which is very true for me, and I would say that's probably even very true for many people in this room who probably think like I do, that Jesus was a real historical person who performed miracles, who claimed to be God, proved he was God, not only through the fulfillment of prophecy, but through his resurrection from the dead and his ascension into heaven, that that he paid the price for our sins and demonstrated a love that is incomparable. And, And I already believe that and know that. And so for me, that carries a great deal of weight, that Jesus, the Messiah who fulfilled all the prophecies of the Old Testament concerning him, (laughs) <laughs> that, that when I say I trust the Bible because Jesus trusted the scriptures, that carries a great deal of weight for me, but maybe not as much for you yet if you don't know, in, you haven't settled in your mind who Jesus is. And so I'm aware of that. But don't allow, if there are certain answers that don't resonate with you, to, for you to assume that there's not specific answers to your questions that could be incredibly helpful just waiting for you to discover. So I I wanna start with this first answer to the question, can I trust the Bible, that I just gave to you. I trust the scriptures because Jesus trusted the scriptures. I I wanna talk about this for a moment. Jesus called the scriptures, and that would have been the Old Testament Hebrew Bible that he had his hands on, which is your Old Testament. Jesus called the scriptures the word of God in John chapter 10, verse 35. Jesus, when he talked about, he said David himself was was speaking by the Holy Spirit when he said, and he was quoting something David said in Mark 12, 36. Jesus referred to miracles throughout the scriptures that that perhaps skeptics and some people would, would question as as real events, historical events. But Jesus cites creation in Luke chapter 11, Adam and Eve in Matthew 19, Noah and the flood in Matthew 24, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah in Luke chapter 10, Jonah and the great fish. The Jonah was three days in the belly of a fish. He, he refers to that as an actual historical event. So Jesus trusted the scriptures. In fact, Jesus affirmed the entire Old Testament as being Scripture. Like in Luke eleven fifty one, 51, when he was warning the religious leaders because they were refusing to obey or believe not only in, in God or his word and Jesus himself, and Jesus is saying they're guilty of this, but he says this in Luke eleven fifty 50 to 51. He said, therefore, This generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that has been shed since the beginning of the world, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Now, what you need to realize when Jesus said that, he was saying that you're held responsible for all the blood of all the prophets that have been shed from Abel, the very first martyr who was killed in Genesis, all the way to uh, Zechariah, who was the last martyr to be killed in the Hebrew Bible in Second Chronicles. Jesus was saying from Genesis to Chronicles. And you're like, well, that's not very far. <laughs> but that's because you have an English version, translation of the Old Testament, which came from the Greek. And, and the Greek translation put the Old Testament into subject categories, history, poetry, because that's the way Greeks did it which means the order of our Old Testament and our Bible is different than the order of the Old Testament and the Bible and the scriptures that Jesus used. Chronicles was last, Second Chronicles, and Genesis was first. So it would be like you saying from Genesis to Malachi. <laughs> That's what Jesus was saying. He was talking about how the whole of the Old Testament scriptures carry the divine authority and inspiration of God. That's what he was declaring. Jesus did this again after his resurrection when he appeared to the disciples. In Luke 24, 44, 
Jesus said to his disciples, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, the works. And so Jesus was basically dividing up the Bible into three big categories, the scriptures that he had of the Old Testament. And he said in all three of these divisions, Jesus was saying all the divisions of the Hebrew scriptures had divine authority. So you have those scriptures. They're just in different order than what would have been in his Hebrew scripture. And so when I ask the question, how, why do I trust the Bible? The first is because Jesus trusted the scriptures. Now, how do I know that Jesus trusted the scriptures? Well, I'll tell you how I know. And it's not just from what he said. Though I quoted him, it's not just from what Jesus said. It's from what Jesus did. In other words, I trust the scriptures because Jesus demonstrated that in the most spiritually intense physically wrecking moments of his life, he trusted the scriptures. I wanna give you some examples of this. When Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights and was weak and hungry in his weakest moment, that's when Satan showed up to tempt him. And he tempted him with everything that would tempt him from food to, to having the kingdoms of the world people, and all these things he was tempting him with. And what in that moment of weakness did Jesus choose to fight with? What did he rely on? What did he go to? He trusted the scriptures to give him voice. And Jesus said with every temptation, it is, and those that you know, go ahead and say it, written. He trusted the scriptures to speak, to speak the truth, to state what was true. He leaned into them. Think of another time that was a moment of crisis for Jesus when Jesus was on the cross at his crucifixion. He'd already been flogged. He'd already been beaten. Crown of thorns on his head. Already been spick mocked. Everything else that happened to him. And as he's dying on the cross, blood flowing. He's in that moment not only paying the physical cost, but he was facing the full wrath of God where the sin of the world was placed on him. He was feeling the wrath of God in that moment. And in that moment, when he felt completely alone and abandoned, not just by the many disciples that had ran away, but even by his own father, what's he do in that moment? What does he go to? What does he rely on? He quoted Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we even learned a month or a half ago or so as we preached on that sermon or, or that text That he was drawing their mind to that whole psalm, which then in the end just lays out for us what happened at his crucifixion. But then also was a psalm that talked about how God would not abandon him. The Father would not abandon his anointed one. He trusted scripture. Then even from the cross, as he was about to breathe his very last, he says, into your hands I commit my spirit, quoting Psalm 31, 5. In those moments of crisis, physically wrecking, emotionally destructive moments. He trusted scripture. That's how I know that Jesus trusted it. And when you, in moments of crisis in your life, go to the word of God and trust in the word of God, you demonstrate without a doubt that you trust it. You believe in it. You rely on it. I'll give you a second reason why I trust the Bible, that as we engage with this, we know it's the the reliable word of God. I trust the Bible because Jesus promised that his Holy Spirit would enable the disciples to recall everything that Jesus said. Jesus told his disciples, the Holy Spirit's gonna come to you and give you miraculous divine recall of everything I've said and done among you. That's why the early church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching because the Holy Spirit was giving them miraculous divine recall of everything Jesus said and did while he was among them. We read about this in John 14 when Jesus is in his final hours with his disciples. And Jesus says, all this I have spoken while still with you, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. And then Jesus went on to say this in John 16, 13. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. That is why whenever we open the word of God from these eyewitnesses, we can trust what we're reading. What we have 
is a promise from Jesus that they would have this supernatural gift of recall through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that leads us into the third reason why I trust the Bible. Because the, the Bible is inspired. Now I'm gonna get into that more next week, that it is inspired. But when 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is God-breathed, and is useful for teaching, correcting, training, and righteousness, God-breathed means out of the mouth of God. That the Bible originated from God as it is spoken by God. This Bible is so reliable because the Holy Spirit is in it. And when you think about it, you know, you might wonder, why wouldn't God just like send an angel to every single person? I mean, that'd be, hey, that'd be believable. Just send an angel to every single person and, and just tell every person what God wants them to know. Just speak it. Why did God not do that? Why did God choose not to just have an angel go to every one of us simultaneously and just tell all of it. And maybe the reason would be because you know how that works when all you have is something that you've heard to retain. Maybe you know how this works that if, when someone tells you something and then you tell someone else and they tell someone else and they tell someone else how the message can get a little uh, convoluted. But when it is written, when it is a written word, those words may be open to interpretation as to what the author means, the intended meaning, but the words are there for us, which provides a trustworthy source. It remains intact. And what we learn from Peter in 2 Peter 1 is that men were carried along by the Holy Spirit as they spoke the words of God, as they wrote these words from God. Jack Cottrell says in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is the source, whether it's oral, spoken prophecy, or the written word like we have in the word of God. We can trust the Bible. Holy Spirit inspired, Holy Spirit divine recall. Jesus trusting the scriptures proves their divine authority. Let me give you a fourth reason that perhaps for someone who's still trying to figure out whether Jesus is who he says he is, let me give you a fourth reason, this may be more helpful to you, why I trust the Bible, and it's because it's completely accurate in its historical references. The Bible is completely accurate in its historical references. And, and I, wanna, I want you to know right now that, that this is exciting to me, but also I am incredibly grateful right now. I am grateful that I live in the 21st century. I am so grateful for that. Not just because of central heat and air and hot water. And I am grateful for that, especially over this last week. Heat, hot water. Thank the Lord for that. Uh, that's been a blessing to us. So I'm grateful to have that. But I'll tell you even a bigger reason why I'm grateful to live. And that's because I have and you have this unique privilege by living in the 21st century that we live in. That we can look back over history and we can see that every single time a historical reference has contradicted the Bible, the biblical reference over time has proven to be a trustworthy source. This has happened again and again, and it continues to happen today. God is continuing to provide more and more evidence for the reliability of Scripture. We especially see this through archaeology and through history even prophecy. We don't grow more skeptical of the Bible. We actually, it becomes more credible. This is actually improving. And archaeology is one of those ways that we see the accuracy of the Bible, the historical accuracy of Scripture. And archaeology is, is it's not static. It, it continues to produce things that are so encouraging. And, and I'm just going to mention a, a couple guys here. Archaeologist William F. Albright, he said, there can be no doubt that archaeology has confirmed the substantial historicity of the Old Testament tradition. So this archaeologist was talking about how the Old Testament can be trusted. Let me give you another archaeologist who's talking about the New Testament, Sir William Ramsey, who is regarded as one of the greatest archaeologists who have ever lived and who was skeptical of the Bible. He was skeptic, but concluded, and here's, this is a quote. He concluded after 30 years of study that Luke, so Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, Luke wrote the book of Acts. And in regard to Luke, here's what Sir William Ramsey said. Luke is a historian of the first rank. Not merely are his statements of fact trustworthy, 
This author should be placed along with the very greatest of historians. Luke's history is unsurpassed in respect to its trustworthiness. McDowell cites that as he quotes Ramsey. Archaeology provides historical accuracy. It doesn't prove that the Bible's true. That's not what archaeology does. It, it just proves the historical accuracy of the Bible. And there are many examples of this. But I'm going I'm to mention just a few. A couple of these examples are mentioned in the book Dinner with Skeptics by Jeff Vines. And I wanted to mention some since Sir William Ramsey personally cites Luke. I'm going to give you a couple examples that Sir William Ramsey would have been aware of from Luke. Examples where, where he proved true as a historian and what he was saying to us. Luke was a physician, a traveling partner of the Apostle Paul. He wrote these two books in our New Testament, the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. And here's one of those examples. It comes from Luke chapter 3, verse 1. You're welcome to go there and look at it, where Luke mentions uh, a lot of historical people and names uh, in that moment. It's pretty impressive. But one of the last people he mentions is found here in Luke chapter 3, verse 1, where Luke says, Lysanias was the Tetrarch of Abilene. He's telling us Lysanias was the Tetrarch of Abilene at that time. For years, historians said that Luke could not be trusted because the historical documents showed that Lysanias was not a Tetrarch, but rather he was the ruler of Chalcis a half a century earlier. Luke had that wrong. But as has often happened, an archaeological dig uncovered an inscription from the time of Tiberius in AD 14 to 37, which names Lysanias as Tetrarch in Abilene near Damascus, just as Luke had written. And so it was like, what do you know? There's another Lysanias, the one that Luke was referring to. And so when we come at his book with skepticism, all of a sudden we begin to realize, wait, Luke can be trusted. Another example occurs in Acts 17, verse 6. It's in this text, uh, in Thessalonica, when Luke makes reference to the polytarchs of Thessalonica. There was this riot. Uh, Polytarchs is translated in your English Bible as city officials. But that word, polytarchs, as he talks about the city officials of Thessalonica. Again, for years, scholars said that Luke could not be trusted because there was no evidence of the term polytarchs anywhere in ancient Roman literature. So it just just wasn't, wasn't true. But today, McDowell reports that 19, inscriptions that make use of that title have been found and interestingly enough five of them five of them are in reference to Thessalonica that Luke was specifically talking about skepticism or trust I'll give you an Old Testament example of the historical accuracy and I'm using this example because you would have read about this these people Uh, in your Bible reading during your first week through Genesis, the Hittites. You've already read about them in this year of Bible engagement, probably a couple times. In fact, the Old Testament will make frequent reference to the Hittites who became this arch enemy of the Israelites. For hundreds of years, scholars argued there was no evidence of the Hittites ever existing, and therefore the Old Testament could not be trusted. And you know, whenever these things are said by historians or the professionals, there's part of you that's kind of like swallows hard and you're like, oh no, you know, is the Bible true? And we wonder. But then in 1906, during an archaeological dig, scientists uncovered and confirmed the existence of the Hittites. They unearthed not only their capital city, but 40 other cities that made up their empire. And so the more we go through life and the more we find that gives credibility to the Bible. Jesus does not call me to a blind faith. He consistently has asked me to consider the evidence and the direction in which it points. I don't have to check my intellect at the door. I I can use my intellect to guide me to ask questions and to seek answers that ultimately lead me to find the truth. And that's why I'm so grateful that I live in the 21st century because as we look back at history and, and archaeology, it, it categ- we can categorically state that where there have been contradictions between the historical records and the biblical records, and because of archaeological discoveries, they have proven the biblical account to be true over, 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 over again. Not once, not twice, 
over and over again. So I trust the Bible. I trust it because Jesus trusted it. I trust it because the Holy Spirit has inspired it. I trust it because the Holy Spirit gave them divine recall. I trust it because of the historical accuracy with which it is written. These are real places, real people, real things happening. And and we continue to find that to be true over and over. Let me give you a fifth reason why I trust the Bible and entrust my life to it. Because of the consistency of the manuscripts. The consistency of the manuscripts. The, The question that comes from this is how do you know that this book that you hold in your hands truly is what was originally written? I mean, we live like a long time after some of these people lived. How do we know that we're actually holding the words that would have been written by them? And so this is what we call the bibliographical test. And that means we're asking the questions, how many copies of the manuscripts are there? What is the time gap from when it actually was written to the earliest copy? And then we ask questions like, how similar are the copies to one another? That's the bibliographical test that's applied to this. And it's exciting to me. And the reason it's exciting to me is because the number of manuscripts that we have is not a static number. It keeps growing with more and more finds. That number from ancient history keeps growing. It's exciting. According to Josh McDowell's updated book, Evidence Demands a Verdict, why is it updated? Because he had to put in the new numbers. It keeps changing. He says in Munster, Germany, the official cataloger of Greek New Testament manuscripts, 5,856 is their official number. But he says, when you deduct some that have been destroyed, some that have gone missing, for various reasons, he says there's well over 5,600 as of January 2017. I remember for years teaching that there were 5,300 and some manuscripts. I don't remember the exact number. Well, it's now over 5,600 manuscripts. But he goes on to say this, but that does not include those that are in private collections. And that does not include those who, who have not yet been published And he says it does not include discoveries that had happened in recent years that were just awaiting official authentication to be factored into the official count. So his book was a 20, he was quoting 2017 statistics in this. So maybe it's already happened by now. I'll give you an example. The earliest verified New Testament fragment, or New, New, excuse me, the, the earliest New Testament Greek manuscript that we had of the Gospel of John was in was the Rylands, John Ryland's papyrus, which is dated 125 to 130 AD, plus or minus 25 years. 125 to 130 AD, plus or minus 25 years. And uh, so that's pretty incredible that from the time of, of the writing of John to that copy, that's a very close manuscript. But he said there is some new contenders that can date earlier than that that are still awaiting Uh, the affirmation, the peer review, and and the publishing that's required for this. He says, one example is the Gospel of Mark. A manuscript was found of the Gospel of Mark that dates as early as 85 to 125 AD. And so to have such an abundance of manuscripts of the New Testament that date within years, some of them, you know, inside of 70 years, of their actual writing. I mean, that is amazing that we have that. There's there's no other ancient work that comes close to that. And so one of the questions that that this asks is, how many manuscripts of this ancient work do we have? Well, I'm gonna show you on the screen a graph, and I'm gonna compare the New Testament to Homer's Iliad, and the reason for that is because the Homer's Iliad has the largest number of surviving copies of any other ancient work. In fact, the number on the screen is higher than it used to be a few years ago because just as you find new copies and manuscripts of the New Testament, they also have found some new copies of Homer's Iliad too. And so when you look at that, Homer's Iliad has 1,900. Many of those are fragments of Homer's Iliad. That's increased significantly since, uh, I don't know, 20 years ago or so, 20 some years ago. The New Testament has over 5,600 Greek manuscripts. And what you need to know is when you add on to that the Greek fragmented copies of the New Testament, there's 24,000 Greek fragmented copies of the New Testament. 
And then when you factor in other biblical manuscripts and scrolls and translations, including the Old Testament scrolls and, scrolls and codices, the total biblical manuscript evidence is 66,286. So I'm gonna put that in perspective really quick. If we were to stack up the manuscripts and just stack them, start stacking them on the stage going upwards, the, the average classical writer would have four feet of material. That's the, the, maybe four feet. That's the average classical writer. Just to put that in perspective, the One World Trade Center is about 1,792 feet. That's the second square over there. The New Testament manuscripts that we have could be stacked a mile. The Old Testament stacked would be one and a half miles. Old and new together, two and a half miles. Does that not blow your mind? The copies, the manuscripts that we have? We have much to compare. The second question that comes into play is what is the interval between the manuscript date and the authorship date? How much time passed? Just to give you an example of this, Homer's Iliad, 850 BC written, 415 BC, earliest frag fragment. That, that's improved in recent years. That's a 435 year interval or so. The New Testament, 40 to 100 AD, 85 to 125 AD, 25 to 85 year interval. The point being, that the time gap between the original and the earliest copies that we have is so short. It's so short. It did not allow time for legends to develop and stories to come into play and people start writing things that, that were not true. The, the facts, the figures, the details, it could be verified. It could be questioned. It could be confirmed by the people who were living. This is why the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 6, he says, when Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared on one occasion to over 500 people, many of whom are still alive. In other words, go ask them. They're right over there. They can tell you about it. So anything that was being written in Scripture could be verified or questioned. People would have called in the question if it was not true. So the time gap matters. <coughs> the third question that comes in the bibliographical test, what are the differences between the manuscripts? with so many copies. What are the difference? And I think it was uh, Geeser that said, you know, it, 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 it could be confusing for some people because some people might be left with the wrong impression when they compare all the manuscripts and they would say, man, there's thousands, there's thousands of errors in the manuscripts from one to another. And he says, errors are not the right word. Variance is the word. Variance in spelling. If, if, if a scribe, changes the spelling, the way that word is used, and then that is copied 3,000 times, that's 3,000 variants. And so there, there's variants. It, it could be spelling, it could be word usage, it could be something like that. But he makes it very clear that, that there are less than 40 places in the New Testament where we're not exactly sure which one was the original reading, but in all of those places, it doesn't change doctrine, it doesn't change faith, the, the variants are so minimal. According to, to Giesler, he says, we have 100% of the New Testament, and we are sure of about 99.5% of it, which one is the original writing. I think it's interesting to note that even if we did not have that manuscript evidence, all of those mountains of, of evidence of manuscripts, if it were to go away, be lost, be burned, if it were absent and we didn't have any of it. I thought it was fascinating to know this, that we could still reconstruct almost the entire New Testament from quotations of the church fathers of the second and third centuries. Only 11 verses are missing, mostly from second and third John. So even if we didn't have the manuscripts, the early church fathers who were quoting and writing scripture could provide us with almost all of it. This is mind-boggling. And when it comes to the Old Testament, one scholar observed that the, the two copies of Isaiah that are found in the Qumran caves proved word for word identical with our standard Hebrew Bible in more than 95% of the text. He said there was 5% of variation that was consisting chiefly of obvious slips of the pen and variations in spelling. The conclusion was that there's... there's no substantial change in the text of the Old Testament in the last you know, 2,000 plus years. 
And there's evidence that there was little change before that. In the book Dinner with Skeptics, professionals and researchers are continually finding documents that can be compared and contrasted to the text that we already have in our possession. And through studying these artifacts, most historians, Christian and non-Christian alike, will tell you that the Bible stands on a plateau far above any other work of literary antiquity. In fact, some would go as far to say, if you cannot trust the Bible, you cannot trust any ancient text. But that's what God has provided for us. And so I would just ask, why is it that we have a book, the Bible, that among all the ancient works just excels far and above in its proven reliability, historicity, its trustworthiness. Why is that? And here's what I would propose. Because God is trustworthy. Because God is trustworthy. Anything that God produces can be trusted. He is trustworthy. He is faithful. And he's gonna give us that which we can hold on to and trust with everything that we have. The Bible is a reliable source. <clears throat> I really do believe that anyone who examines it honestly will come to a, an eventual conclusion that it proves reliable. One question that people sometimes ask has to do with, well, how did they determine which books go into the Bible? The Bible's made of 66 books. How did they determine which ones go in here? Who decided that? Who decided that this was the word of, of God? And that's, that, that has to do with canonicity. And, and there's a whole topic on that that we could go in deep if we wanted to. Josh McDowell does a pretty good job of that. But, but the word canon comes from the word read. A read was used as a standard of measurement, so it became the standard. The canon was the standard. Later, canon also came to mean list or index. So it, it's the list, the standard of measurement. As it relates to the Bible, it means an official list of accepted books. And what I want to say about that, I think something that's important, is the church did not create the canon. It did not determine which books would be called Scripture, the inspired Word of God. Instead, the church recognized was what books were already inspired from their inception. They were just recognizing that. In other words, the book is not the word of God because it's accepted by the people of God. It was accepted by the people of God because it is the word of God. God gave the book its divine authority. The New Testament scholar, Lee Martin McDonald, states, while the definition of a biblical canon has more to do with the end process, that is with a fixed list of sacred scriptures, the authority attributed to those writings was recognized much earlier. In other words, before the books were put together in a list, they were already being read in synagogues and circulated among the early church as Scripture. As, it was already recognized as the Word of God. And there are many things that go into that, why that was the case, which I don't have time for. But, you know, even Paul, in writing to the Thessalonican church, in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, he said, And we also thank God continually, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. He was acknowledging, they were already receiving this as the word of God. And, and there's a host of reasons why, but the canon, the list, the standard, was put together not, not to decide which books were inspired, it was to provide the list to guard against the books that were not. There, there was a growing list of books that were being written and produced to churches by false teachers that were not inspired scripture. It was to guard against that. It was to protect the church from those works that were not the word of God. So when we come to this question, can I trust the Bible? Well, manuscripts, history, archaeology, Jesus' validity, I mean, all of that certainly leads me to say I can trust the Scriptures. It does that for me. But that doesn't necessarily say to you that this is the Word of God, that it came from Him. We could go way deep into that. I'm just going to mention something right now I don't have time to get into very deep, but I think one that, that really does Make it clear, this is the word of God. And it's the sixth reason why I trust the Bible. I trust the Bible because of fulfilled prophecies. 
Now, I don't have time to really get into this. Floyd Hamilton, in the basis of Christian faith, he writes that, that Canon Lydon is the authority for this statement that says, there are 332 distinct prophecies that were literally fulfilled in the person of Jesus. That's how many prophecies were fulfilled in him. Now, I'll mention just a few of these. His divinity, his humanity. He'd be born in Bethlehem, he'd be adored by Magi. His miracles, the triumphal entry, his betrayal by his own friend, betrayed for 30 pieces of silver and that, that those 30 pieces would buy a potter's field. His crucifixion, before crucifixion was invented, being offered gall and vinegar at the cross. Bones not broken, burial with the rich. His resurrection, his ascension. And we could go on and on and someone might say, well, some of those prophecies, if you read them, were fulfilled by Kennedy or Nasser or King, you know, these, these famous people in the world. Well, maybe a couple, but not all. <laughs> There's only one who fulfilled them all, and it, it was Jesus. In fact, one time, th there was significant money that was being offered to anyone who could provide a name of anyone in the world who fulfilled even half of the prophecies about Jesus, and no name was produced because the prophecies verify that Jesus is who he said he was, that the word of God is truly the word of God. In fact, Fred John Maldo shares of a time that, that he offered a reward and couldn't find anyone to come up with anyone who could fulfill these prophecies like Jesus did. And so I, I don't have time to address all the prophecies of Scripture, even the great prophecy of Tyre and what that meant. That's one, if you just read about it, Tyre, T-Y-R-E, incredible story of prophecy in the Bible from the Old Testament. But when I ask this question, can I trust the Bible? Can I trust it? Even if I don't get into how it was written, how it was meticulously copied, all the historians that align with it, like Josephus and others, even if I don't get into the external evidence, citations from early church fathers, methods for transmitting the scriptures reliably, entire books that have been written to do all of that justice, when I come to the question of can I trust the Bible, my prayer is that even what I've shared with you today can lead you eventually to a place where you would say, yes, I can. I can entrust my life to it, just like Jesus entrusted his life to it. I, I, I can follow it. I can believe it. I can rely on it. But I'm going to tell you right now, the true test as to whether or not you trust the Bible Here's the true test that determines whether or not you actually trust the Bible. It's not gonna be in what you say. It's this. The primary way, primary way you demonstrate you trust the Bible is through your obedience. I can say I trust it. I, I, I can talk about archaeological finds. I, I can look at the manuscripts. I mean, there's all kinds of things we can do. But if I'm not in obedience to God's word, then I don't trust it. If I'm not engaging it and then doing what it says, I don't trust it. Your behavior either affirms that you trust it or it's speaking to the contrary of what you say. If there's a disconnect between what we say and how we behave, there's a lack of trust. Faith is knowledge, assent, and trust. I've got to trust it. You do not trust the scriptures if you are not in obedience to the scriptures. If we're not engaging it, obeying it, it's just clear we don't trust it. And my prayer today is not only would you engage with it, but you would trust it and trust your life to it. The word of God is life-giving. It'll change your life. And that's what we're gonna be talking about in the coming weeks, what the word of God does. Maybe you're familiar with this hymn, Trust and Obey. An old hymn, Trust and Obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. If you're not experiencing joy in the Lord, if you're not experiencing happiness in the Lord, it may be that you're not in obedience to his word. Obedience to his word brings joy. In fact, the, the, this hymn we're gonna sing in just a moment, tis so sweet to trust. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. It is sweet to trust him. The word of God has even been described as that which is sweet to the taste good to consume and eat. 
And my prayer is that we'd be people who would hunger and thirst for the word of God. We would hunger and thirst for righteousness. We meditated, as David said, day and night. That was one of our prayers this week. Help us to meditate on your word day and night. Let it consume us as we consume it. Let it change us. May we submit to it, be obedient to it. We have reason to trust it. This is God's word to us. And as you stand to your feet right now, my prayer is that right now you would make that determination. In fact, today if you have yet to make Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life, or maybe you just want to pray with someone today, or maybe today you want to become a member of this church and learn what that means, we want to give you a chance to respond. I want to be stepping out decision point right over here. I'd love to meet you there. If you're watching online, go to northsidechristianchurch.net slash decision to begin that conversation with us right here. I think this is also a time for us to demonstrate our trust through what we read and what we obey. As you leave today and you go out those doors, there's boxes around the room where you can obey God in another area of your life as you declare your love for him, that he's first, and you want to give him your best. And so as you leave today, you can give your offering as an act of worship to the Lord, putting him first in your life. And if you want to give online, you can go to northsidechristianchurch.net to do that or text the number that's on the screen as an act of worship of trust in the Lord. But it is my prayer that as we engage with God's word, it will continue to grow in us and prove true in us. And Lord, I just pray that I pray that you would change us through your word and that we would trust you. We would believe in you. We would seek after you. We wouldn't just ask the questions. Lord, we would seek for those answers and that in so doing, we would know you better. Lord, I pray your blessing over us as we go through this week engaging with the word that you have given us. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.